So don't say anything you don't want recorded. So uh, good morning to everyone and all those who are listening on the recording. Now we're in the future. Uh, we're going to go through our gospel lesson today again. I preached on it, but there's some extra things that we can talk about, and I can go through it in a little more detail than uh, just uh, what I did in the sermon. So let us begin with prayer. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us a purpose in life and giving us work to do in this earthly life. And we thank you, Lord, also for recognizing that we do need a time of rest, rest for our minds, our bodies, our souls, and that you give us that rest. We thank you that Jesus is the one who has won the victory over all of the problems of sin and death itself that we may find rest in him. Help us all to be strengthened in our faith and to always cling to Christ to know that he will give us the ultimate rest that we look forward to with yourself in heaven. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. First, I need to share my screen here, and we're going to do a little bit of context. So let's see. Share. There we go. Hopefully that's on your screen now. Um, it looks to me like Bible Gateway did an update because this is a different format than it's used to than I'm used to seeing. But that's fine. I still made it as big a font as I can. Hopefully you can see that okay. So the gospel lesson today is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. And we've skipped a little bit from where we were the last couple of weeks. We were in Matthew chapter 10. And just a little heads up as well. Uh, next week, we're going to skip a little bit as well. Next week, we go to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, or 13, sorry, Matthew chapter 13. And then I think like two weeks from now until clear into the fall, we're going to have a straight reading in our gospel lessons through the gospel of Matthew. So we're going to get a good dose of the middle chunk of the gospel of Matthew as our gospel lessons for the next oh, month and a half, two months. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. That's good. Um, in chapter 10, you may recall, Jesus uh, was uh, his second discourse that is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, or second sermon, if you want, the first one being the Sermon on the Mount. Well, he's finished that, and we see that right here in the beginning of uh, chapter 11, when Jesus had, in, had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. So it, it clearly shows it's the closure of that moment of teaching slash sermon from chapter 10. And now he's going around Galilee and all the towns and villages, teaching and preaching throughout that region. And it's kind of interesting having been there, any, uh, any of you who have been there, it's a fairly hilly area. And so it takes a little bit of time, especially when you're walking, to get from one town or village to the next. But uh, uh, it certainly is um, something that uh, Jesus was um, uh, very uh, interested and willing to do to spread the word. Uh, now, uh, just to kind of zip through a little bit till we get to our, um, our gospel lesson, verse 2 in chapter 11 says, Now when G John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And, and they come to Jesus and ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So right here, while Jesus is wandering around Galilee, word of him is spreading. Word gets all the way to John in prison, and John is probably imprisoned down by Jerusalem. Uh, that's where um, Herod would be. And uh, he hears, probably through his own disciples, that uh, of all the miraculous things and the, the profound teaching that Jesus is doing. And so he sends his disciples to ask Jesus this question. Now, at other points in time when we do a Bible study, or sometimes I've, on a sermon when we do this particular text, I brought up, and I know other pastors have too, and it's uh, that um, was John having doubts or was, were his disciples having doubts that he sent his disciples, John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus? And, you know, we don't know. My answer is probably a little bit of each. Maybe uh, Jesus isn't quite the type of Messiah, the fire and brimstone uh, Messiah that John the Baptist, who was kind of a fire and brimstone type of preacher, very forceful preacher. So maybe Jesus isn't quite what John expected and he's having doubts. Or perhaps also part of it is, uh, maybe, maybe even a little more likely, that John is trying to convince his own disciples that Jesus is the Messiah. So he sends them to question Jesus about this. And uh, Jesus says, go and tell John the Baptist what you see and hear. You know, look at the miracles that I've done. The miracles speak 
to who I am. And that is part of the reason for the miracles. We know that throughout scripture, throughout the gospels, all of them. Jesus did miracles because yes, he had compassion. He wanted to help people, but he also did miracles to reveal that he is the Messiah. He is the son of God. He is divine. And so that was part of it. And it's interesting here in verse five too, that the, he lists all these miracles. And the last thing he lists is the poor have good news preached to them. What's the most important thing? The good news being preached, of course. And then verse seven, I'll skim through this kind of quickly. Verse seven, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John and how uh, John lived a very sparse life and he lived out in the wilderness and yet uh, people rejected him. And uh, Jesus was kind of the opposite. He lived, uh, he, he did not live quite as sparse a life. He lived off the goodwill of the people and, and the others that were around. And yet he also was rejected. Uh, and so it's kind of a case where Jesus is pointing out whether you're this style, John the Baptist style, or Jesus style, this particular style, yet people will reject the word of God no matter what. Uh, I think there's a little, just a little underlying kind of practical lesson there for us that um, uh, it doesn't matter how the word goes out, but that it goes out. And um, certainly we all prefer certain, you know, uh, portions of the gospel message or a certain style, or some of us prefer parables, other of us, other of us might prefer, you know, straight teaching like Paul from Romans kind of thing, but some people will receive the word and some people will reject it, so, however it happens. And then after um, uh, Jesus re extols the virtues of John and talks about uh, John and compares him to himself right here in verses 18 and 19, then he starts um, talking about the unrepentant cities. Some heavy law here. He's denouncing all the cities that uh, have rejected him. Now he's been walking around Galilee which is kind of considered the back country to the southern area. The, the, the people in Jerusalem would have considered themselves the more sophisticated, the more worldly people. And those Galileans, they were, they were the country bumpkins. And a lot of those people up there, like the people down in Jerusalem, were also rejecting Jesus, were unrepentant. And so there's a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, chastising here on the part of Jesus. Um, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, and then in verse 23, uh, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. So he's giving them some stern law here. And uh, it's interesting that as John's disciples have left, Jesus then now begins to excoriate and rebuke the unrepentant cities in the area. I wonder if, <laughs> this is just uh, really meaningless, but John was a fire and brimstone type preacher. Woe to you and repent. Uh, you know, John was a very forceful preacher. Jesus seems to be a little bit less so. He's talking more about uh, beware the kingdom of heaven is near. And he's more of a teaching kind of a, a preacher. And yet, as soon as John's disciples leave, all of a sudden he's got some hard law here, which sounds more stylistically like John the Baptist. I don't know. Make with, that, make with that what you will, but it just, I found it kind of interesting. All right, so that's what's happened here in the first part of chapter 11 after the um, second discourse. And then we come to our, uh, our gospel lesson, which is verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus declared. So first of all, he has a bit of an abrupt change. He's talking about uh, uh, the the unrepentant cities, and now all of a sudden at that time, we don't know exactly where he was, is somewhere in Galilee, and he declares, and he says, he, this is a prayer to God the Father. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Pause right there. Um, so this is a short prayer, and then he's going to change and talk to his disciples some more, but um, What's he talking about that you have hidden these things? What are these things that he's hidden? Well, I think it's the kingdom of God. It's the, the gospel message about the kingdom of heaven. You remember the parable that Jesus tells about uh, the, the man finding a pearl of priceless treasure in a field, and then he goes and sells everything he has to buy that field so he can have that pearl. Um, 
in one sense, and I'm not trying to get into that particular parable, but in one sense, the great pearl of great value is the gospel message about Jesus. And it's sometimes hidden from the wise and understanding, but revealed to little children. What does that tell us? Sometimes we overthink things. We think too much. We uh, try to explore and explain every little thing. And, you know, Jesus elsewhere says uh, it's the faith of a little child that saves you. Little children are very quick to trust and believe and uh, not question. And what happens is as we grow, we begin to question things. We begin to wonder why. And, and uh, that starts to get into the way of just pure faith, the faith of a child. That's what we need. The wise don't understand because they're questioning too much. They're delving too deeply, but the simple do. I think part of the issue is pride. That's just me speaking a little bit here, that uh, as we grow more in knowledge and we grow uh, older and more mature, I think I, in our human thinking, we start to become filled with pride. Look what I know, look what I can do, look what I have achieved and can achieve. And so we want to start thinking about what do we need to do to achieve salvation or forgiveness. And uh, we want to have some involvement in it. Children, on the other hand, don't have that problem. <laughs> you tell them something and they believe it. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the jokes about telling a child, uh, well, it was a Calvin and Hobbes joke I remember one time where the father was telling Calvin, he said, yeah, um, Calvin asked, what happens when the sun sets? And he said, well, it's, nothing really happens because see how small it is? It's the size of a quarter. And so when it hits the earth, when it sets, there's nothing left. It's not that hot. And then Calvin walks away and said, wow, my dad really knows a lot. <laughs> I still remember that little cartoon from Calvin and Hobbes. So hopefully some of you remember that comic strip. It was a great comic strip. But, you know, sometimes people can pull, over the, pull the wool over the eyes of kids and they'll believe them. And it's good that they do that they have a little bit of that naivete and just believe without, without questioning. That is somewhat good because that shows a strong faith, a deep faith, and we lose that as we grow older. Uh, the truth of the gospel message is you can't do anything. There's nothing you can do. Um, I want to give a little example. I just uh, uh, I thought of this as I was making my notes. What happens when a child gets a gift, a gift of something they want, a toy? What do they do? Oh, they want to open it and play. Sometimes, you know, you're trying to get them to finish opening the rest of their gifts during the birthday party or whatever, but they want to play with this one. Yes, I got this gift. It's what I want. I want to play with it. Um, that shows they get a gift from God, you know, in faith, and they say, oh, yes, I'll just receive it, and I want to use it, play with it. What happens to adults when we get a gift? If you get an unexpected gift at an unexpected time, Quite often, maybe not always, but quite often, the thought that runs through our human brains is, why did I get this? Does somebody want something from me? Now do I owe them a favor of some sort? Uh, do I, did I do something for them that they're repaying me? We automatically start thinking quite often, not always, quite often, in reciprocation. What did I do? Did I deserve this somehow? Did I earn it from somebody? They gave me this unexpected uh, gift, and I, I don't know, Should, uh, how can I give thanks? How can I re give them thanks for the thing they've did, done for me? Well, the truth is God gives you a great gift, the greatest gift of all, the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, and there's nothing we did to deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. We just need to play with it, like a child opening a, a, you know, a box uh, with toys in it. Just accept it. Receive it. Yes, give thanks but just receive it and use it, the gift of faith that God gives to each one of us. And so I think that's part of what Jesus is talking about right here when he says, um, you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So keep that in mind. I think that's uh, good for all of us. God is the actor here. God is the one who has hidden these things from the wise and understanding and has revealed them to little children. We don't do anything. God is the one who does it. And guess what? He's revealed his will, his faith, his son, Jesus Christ, to all of you. We are his little children. He's revealed that to you. All right. Verse 27. Uh, now he, the, kind of the prayer ends. It's again, a little bit of abrupt. So we have a few kind of strung along statements here from Jesus in this short little paragraph. 
So now he's apparently finished the prayer. He's turned to his disciples and he's addressing them. All things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So first of all, there's a little mystery of the Trinity being revealed here, that the father and the son are very closely connected. Of course, the Holy Spirit is too, but he's not mentioned here. Uh, but God the Father and God the Son know each other extremely well. And no one can know God the Father except through the Son. See, that's what he says here. No one knows the Father except the Son and whoever the Son chooses to reveal him to. So again, you know, this is a, maybe a little bit of a, our Lutheran tech, a theology. And I almost said Lutheran technology, <laughs> Lutheran theology, which some other Christians do get this as well, but some don't. If you want to know more about God, you look at Jesus, you examine Jesus, you learn about Jesus. Jesus reveals the nature of God to us. And sometimes, uh, you know, we or other Christians may get uh, embroiled in trying to find God by looking for God. We can't find God, first of all. Secondly, he, God reveals himself by showing Jesus to us. So it's all through Christ, and it's Christ's action to us. So see again here, he points out um, anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Who's the actor? Who's the one doing something here? In this case, it's Jesus. So in the previous little prayer, it was God the Father. Now it's Jesus. Well, God the Father and God the Son are very closely related in that mysterious Trinity way. Um, and so it's their doing that we have the revelation about God and that we have faith in God. It's all what they do it's through Jesus. All right, now verse 28, 28 and following here. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, first of all, I think this has multiple meanings. I kind of uh, dwelt on this in the, um, in the sermon. That's the, basically these three verses are the focus of my sermon today, those of you who heard it. And I think there's multiple meanings here, as there are always layers of scripture. First of all, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. I think that talks about, in one sense, the actual living of the Christian life. Is living the Christian life filled with work? Yeah, it is. We have much work to do. We, uh, we need to do the work of the church, the work of evangelism, the work of ministry, the work of serving, the work of stewardship. Uh, we have lots of work to do that God gives us. And does the burden of work drag us down? Well, yes, it does. It shouldn't, but it does. Why does the burden of work drag us down? Because of sin. Now, a little uh, side comment about this. I've said this to some graduates myself. Maybe some of you have also, some of you who are teachers, and you've heard this bit before. Find a job that you enjoy doing, and you'll never work a day in your life. You've heard that little phrase before, I'm sure. And certainly it's true. If you enjoy the work you do, it won't seem like toil. It'll be less wearisome. It'll still wear you down. You still need times of rest, but it'll be less wearisome if you find a job, a vocation of something you enjoy doing. And yet, and that's, and that's how God would have intended. Before sin, God gave Adam and Eve the job of being the caretakers of creation. And it was a joy-filled job. It was not a burden. So what happened? Sin happened. Sin gets in the way and causes work to be a burden. So the work that we do as Christians in our Christian life and living the Christian life Sometimes, maybe more times than not, I don't know, sometimes it ends up just being a burden. It's hard. It's, it's, it's laborious. It's difficult. Uh, so that's one of the meanings that Jesus has here, I think, one of uh, multiple meanings. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to list for you three. So one of them is just in the work of the Christian life, doing what we know we need to do. You know, there's sometimes in the Christian life where you know you need to serve your neighbor, you know you need to serve your spouse, you should do something, you should pray, you should, um, you know, volunteer for something, and you just don't feel like it. There's that sin in this earthly life, and we just, it drags us down. 
and we know we should do it and maybe you force yourself to to do that good deed whatever you need to do and yet it's still kind of hard again because of that sin okay the second thing i think jesus is referring to about come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest i think he's also talking about our fight against sin that's a constant labor that we have a fight against temptation a fight against the devil there are times in, in all of our lives where you, you see a temptation coming. The devil knows your weak spots. He sends those temptations to you, and you know you should resist, and yet you can't. Uh, your body just engages in that sinful behavior or that sinful thought or those sinful words just pop out of your mouth, and you know they shouldn't, and you fight against it, and yet it's, it's hard. Paul talks about that, by the way, today in our epistle lesson. The good that I do, uh, the good that I know I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, that's what I do. That's what Paul's talking about in the epistle lesson. Well, that's a constant labor, a constant struggle for all of us as well. It's just the fight against sin, the fight against uh, the temptations of the devil. And that wears us down also. Uh, also, I think this uh, talks about the labor, and this is the third one. I think Jesus is also talking about the labor of trying to achieve salvation. That is a common misunderstanding, misbelief uh, among in the human in the human brain, in human nature, that we want to do something to earn salvation. We want to deserve it. God, look, I'm a good person. And so many world religions, and it creeps into Christianity a little bit around the edges too, so many world religions are religions of um, uh, doing something to earn your salvation, however they define salvation. I deserve to be forgiven. I deserve to be saved. I deserve to be redeemed. Look at the good things I do. They're works-based religions. All other world religions are that way. Christianity is not, although, you know, yes, it still creeps into Christianity sometimes too. So when we labor under the false belief that we have to do something to be forgiven, that's a hard labor. That's a heavy laden, uh, a heavy burden, because we can never completely compensate for all of our sins. Our sins are so complete and so vast, we can never do enough good deeds to overcome our sin. Martin Luther tried, after all. You know that, you know the story of Luther. He tried to do what was right and overcome and resist his temptations, live the perfect sinful life, resist his temptations, and earn his salvation. He tried to do all of those, and he couldn't. So this would speak very profoundly to Martin Luther. I think it did. I, you know, I didn't look up to see if he had any commentary on, on these couple of verses. Maybe I should have done that. But I think it also speaks to all of us in all three of those circumstances as well. We labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sometimes it just feels good to have rest, doesn't it? God gave us rest. He commanded us to rest in uh, creation itself. He, on the seventh day, you shall rest. Now, because Jesus rose on the eighth day, we have switched our uh, day of rest to the eighth day, which is Sunday, but that's still uh, recognizing the... Um, the value of weekly rest, a day of rest on Sunday. And so we come to church and we can have rest for our souls. We have rest for our minds and our hearts, you know, doing something pleasant or beneficial or uh, relaxing on a Sunday. Uh, we should have rest for our bodies as well. And yes, I know many of us have sleep issues, <laughs> but God wants us to, to sleep. So there's lots of, lots of ways where we should try and take advantage of that gift of God, of rest. Rest for our bodies, minds, hearts, and especially for our souls. Have you? I would point out to you, just to ask you, do you ever feel uh, weary in your soul? You know, we've all felt weariness in our body. Your body is just tired. You've done a lot of work. You've done a lot of chores. Maybe you were gardening. Maybe you were, you know, raking leaves in the fall. You're just tired. Your body's tired. You know you need rest. I know many occas uh, occasions where I have felt mentally tired. Uh, the one that I can reach back to is, back in college, nearly uh, pretty much every time at the end of finals week. I'd been studying hard for a week beforehand and then I'm focused hard on the finals. And I can remember I'd get to the end of finals week and it happened all the way through college. I just felt brain dead. 
You know, I couldn't focus on anything. I just needed to go like sit and vegetate in front of a movie or, uh, you know, kind of watch a couple of TV shows and kind of do nothing for a few days to let your brain relax. Some of you have maybe felt that way for other reasons as well. Certainly emotionally tired. I mentioned all of these in the sermon as well, but I'm mentioning them again here. You know, you're really helping someone out. You're reaching out for someone. You're kind of the shoulder for them to cry upon. You're maybe going through an emotional tough time yourself, and you just feel emotionally drained. <coughs> Pardon me. I did come across the term compassion fatigue, and uh, I felt that. I'm sure some of you have felt that too, where you just don't feel like you can work up the emotional response that you should, whether it's joy or whether it's empathy, you're just kind of flat. That happens as well. Those all happen for various reasons, but I think the most important one that Jesus is addressing here is rest for our souls. You're just spiritually drained. You feel distant from God. You just need rest. God gives you that rest. Jesus gives you that rest. What's one of the things Jesus regularly did we, uh, during his ministry, during his three years of ministry? We hear this most often in the Gospel of Luke, but a little bit in the other Gospels as well. Jesus went away for a time of solitude and rest. Interesting. He would pray and he would rest and he would take his disciples with him. And sometimes we don't know how long they were gone. Sometimes it might only be a day or two or a week or whatever. But uh, Jesus did that. Certainly we need to do that too. I have to tell you, um, just a side note, kind of a little mental field trip here from this conversation, but it re directly relates to this. I just saw a little news blip as I was checking the news earlier this week about a growing trend in Silicon Valley. Now, this will not be a surprise to any of you, but there's this growing trend in Silicon Valley among uh, technology people that they would take uh, a weekend or a week, a couple times a year, and go off to the mountain and unplug and leave all of their technology behind and just spend some quiet time either by themselves or with one or two close friends or a spouse or whatever, and just have, and actually they called it like uh, extended unplugging or something. I don't remember what the name of it was. Quiet time without, uh, a fa oh, I know what they called it, a technology fast. That's what it was called. It was in the, in the little article. They have a technology fast. We are bombarded with so much stimuli in this culture. Sometimes, I think it's good to unplug, whether it's for an hour in church or for a weekend once every quarter or for a week or two once a year. We just kind of unplug and rest. We need that. You know, like in my case, I'm going to take a book with me. I don't know if Jill's on or not, but uh, some of you know we're going on vacation this coming week and we're going camping up north to Quaminan Falls. It'll be nice. It's pretty up there. Hopefully, um, pleasant weather. It's supposed to be pleasant weather. Uh, I'm going to take a book and just read a book. <laughs> uh, haven't done that in a little while. I don't even know if we'll get cell phone signal up there. Maybe we won't, and that's maybe a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that is a good thing for all of us to do. Jesus did it. And that's part of what he's talking about here, to just have rest. Just have rest. All right. Then he says, verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is a yoke? Well, I'm not a farmer. I don't know specifically, but I've, you know, I've seen the pictures, seen the images. Some of you have too. You'd have two oxen, and they'd have this wooden bar across the top, and there'd be loops underneath, and the two oxen would be yoked together. Now, why would they do that? I'm told, or what I've read, is that when the two oxen are yoked together, they work in tandem and the work is easier. It's easier to pull the plow. It's easier to pull the uh, whatever other devices, you know, the, uh, for, for harvesting, you know, the, the cart, the, the trailer, whatever. It's easier for them to work. And if one of the oxen is a little bit weaker than the other, then the stronger one can compensate and they can kind of share the load. They can work together. And that's a good thing. So what is Jesus talking about here? Take my yoke upon you. So in other words, be yoked with Christ. Be yoked together with him. Now he's the strong one and we are the weak one. In fact, in terms of salvation, he's already done all the work. 
Does he leave us with stuff to do here on earth? Yes, we have a purpose. We are God's caretakers. He gives each of you a vocation. The most uh, obvious one of which is to pray and encourage and support your fellow uh, neighbor and your church and all the rest. That's a vocation all of us have, plus other vocations as well. God gives us work to do. Jesus has already done the work of salvation. But in the work he's given for us to do, we're yoked with Christ, and he's the stronger one. So he helps us do it. So there is, it's, it's an easier job for us. We're kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, mooching off of, sponging off of the strength of Christ. And he tells us that. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Uh, what a wonderful statement. He is gentle and lowly in heart. Quite the contrary to John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist was very forceful. Jesus we, it does come across kind of almost as a pacifist, if you will, very gentle and lowly in heart. And he is one that would uh, encourage and gender us to follow him uh, because uh, he helps us through. I'm looking down at my notes and I do see, I kind of thought up a quick example right here in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I have this image that I thought of of a farmer trying to, he's a farmer's son, using the rope that goes up over the pulley to lift a bale of hay into the hayloft of the barn. You can picture that. I've seen that, you know, in pictures or videos before. And this young farmer's son is trying to pull the rope and he's not quite doing it right. And he can't, the bale of hay is a little bit too heavy. He can't quite get it up. So the farmer comes along and says, let me help you, let's work together. And the two of them work together, and he shows him the proper technique, maybe, for pulling the rope. And the two of them, the farmer is doing the majority of the work, but the farmer's son is also doing some work and is learning from him. And together, they can lift the bales of hay and slide them into the hayloft in the top of the barn. Uh, that's just an image. There's other images you could paint, but just a thought of how Jesus helps us in the Christian work that we are to continue to do. Uh, but we are, but we do have the help of Christ. He does help us with that. And you will find rest for your souls, even in the midst of all the work. I mentioned three kinds of work that uh, we are burdened with. Um, you will find rest for your souls, regular rest. We need that. And he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, I think that's a reference, especially to the third form of work, the work under the law, the work of trying to earn your forgiveness or earn your salvation. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light because he's already done it. Forgiveness is yours, free of charge. You don't need to do anything. Does that make the yoke easy? The yoke of forgiveness, the yoke of salvation? Of course it does. Your burden is extremely light. In fact, there is no burden in, in terms of forgiveness. Jesus has done the burden. There is still a burden in living the Christian life and doing the, the ministries and the service that God wants us to do for one another. I have a quote from Martin Luther. Let me pull my book over here. Uh, this is actually in the Lutheran Study Bible in the study footnotes, but it's a quote from Martin Luther. Uh, he says this uh, in a, a, exactly in reference to these two verses, verses 29 and 30. Martin Luther says, The yoke that Christ lays upon us is sweet, and his burden is light. When sin has been forgiven and the conscience has been liberated from the burden and the sting of sin, then a Christian can bear everything easily. Because everything within is sweet and pleasant, he willingly does and suffers everything. You can do everything and you can suffer everything and you can persevere everything because you know Jesus is with you and he's already done the hard work. And he's already granted you forgiveness free of charge. How wonderful is that? That is tremendous. All right, this is a little bit of a shorter gospel lesson, and I've kind of gotten through it already, and we've only been, what, half hour, 35 minutes. I do have some closing thoughts, and then uh, I also have a couple of announcements as well, and, and then we can get on to chit-chatting if we want to. Oh, anyone have any questions before we go on with that? Steve is reminding me. Any questions out there? I don't have everyone on my screen, Steve. Can you see anybody? All right, very good. Uh, I would uh, kind of summarize some of this by saying part of it is that uh, it's the difference between the hidden and the revealed. Remember up, uh, up here at the beginning in verse 25, the difference between uh, 
the things that are hidden from the wise, but revealed to little children. I think that's the gospel message, the ease of the gospel message. The gospel message of forgiveness through Jesus Christ is revealed to little children. You don't need to do anything for it. It's free of charge. Yet it's hidden from the wise and the understanding who are trying to look for something to do to earn it, to deserve it. So from them, the gospel is clouded. But from little children, it is revealed. Also, I think then the latter por portions of this little um, uh, paragraph from Jesus, talking about the heavy or light burden. The burden of the law is heavy. Trying to earn your, your salvation, trying to earn forgiveness, trying to find your way on your own is very heavy. It's a difficult burden. And yet the gospel is a light burden. It's a non-existent burden, really. It's free. Jesus forgives you free of charge. So there is no burden, really. And the only burden we have left is the burden of loving and serving our neighbor. And that's it. So the gospel is a light burden. All we need to really do is repent, admit our sin, repent, and then just stay in faith. Cling to the faith God has given you. That's the lightness of the burden that the gospel is. God, I'm sorry for my sins. Help me stay strong in faith. There you go. That's the lightness of the burden. So, uh, and then also the, the third thing I would summarize in here is about rest. We need rest. All parts of our lives need rest, most especially our soul. I know many of you in our church, and I've heard this from other members outside of our church as well, that sometimes, you know, you come to church and you have that hour or so where you just hear exactly what you needed to hear. And you just find it restful, peaceful, rejuvenating, helpful. You can come here and you can forget about the troubles of life for a while and just let God um, help you. God serve you. And that is a wonderful thing. God gives you rest. So there's kind of my summary of all those things. All right. Um, are there any questions that have popped up now? Any? No. no? All right. So let me unshare my screen. There we go. Now I can kind of see most of you there. Uh, I'm thinking maybe we could close with the Lord's Prayer and then I could do a couple of, uh, I have a couple quick announcements for everybody, all of you here. Um, and then uh, we can go on with some chit chat if we want after that. Okay. So I think you have to unmute yourself. Is that true, Steve? I'll unmute everyone and then they can mute themselves if they need to. You can't unmute everybody, can you? I do. I do. I thought they were muted. Whenever you're okay. ready, Pastor. Is everyone unmuted? Yeah. Mostly. Hey, I'm not trying to. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, let's join together, even as just disjointed as it sometimes is with our delays. It's still good for us to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. And we are his people united together uh, in the peace and the love that he has given us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord and the, uh, the, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, a couple of announcements.